In this presentation we talk about the ideal gas law, which is one of the most fundamental laws in the theory of heat known as thermodynamics. In the first lesson we will discuss the following topics. We start with a brief overview of some physical properties, such as volume, mass, pressure and temperature, which provide a full description of the physical state of a gas. As opposed to the measurement of the volume or the mass of a gas, it is not so straightforward how to determine gas pressure and temperature. Therefore, we clarify the definitions of pressure and temperature, and present the most frequently applied methods and instruments to measure these quantities. In order to study gaseous substances in thermodynamics, we will discuss three laws of nature which describe the behavior of a real gas in given circumstances. These laws, called gas laws, are used to define a model substance known as ideal gas, and they determine the relationship between the different properties of an ideal gas. The first gas law is Boyle's law which relates the pressure and the volume of an ideal gas. After some historical remarks, we present the basic experiment demonstrating the relationship between the pressure and the volume of a gas at a constant temperature, and we formulate this relationship in Boyle's law. The second gas law is known as Charles's law, and it describes the relationship between the volume and the temperature of an ideal gas at a constant pressure. Here we also provide some historical background, and then present the original experiment leading to the basic idea of Charles's law. Nevertheless, we will demonstrate this law by a more complicated method, which, in principle, allows a more accurate measurement of gas properties. The result of this experiment helps us to formulate the law. The third gas law is Gay-Lussac's law, which relates the pressure and the temperature of an ideal gas confined to a constant volume. After some historical remarks we present an experiment, which is similar to the one performed in the demonstration of Charles's law. Based on the findings of this experiment, we formulate the third gas law. Then we will introduce the thermodynamic or absolute temperature scale, which allows us to express the three gas laws in more simple forms as functions of absolute temperature. By applying such simple forms, we can combine the gas laws into a single equation. Finally, we present the ideal gas law emerging as the combination of these three laws. This combined gas law determines the relationship between the pressure, the volume and the absolute temperature of an ideal gas and it is known as its equation of state of an ideal gas. Then we will demonstrate that the three gas laws can be regarded as special cases of the ideal gas law. Before we present the physical quantities describing the state of a gas, let us clarify why we start our study with gases. Our everyday experience shows us that matter exists in different forms in nature, and these forms represent the different physical states of matter. We can see four states of matter in the world we live in. Solid, liquid, gas and plasma state. There also exists some exotic, intermediate states of matter, such as Bose-Einstein condensates or quark-gluon plasma. Since they are far from our everyday experience, it is enough to consider the four natural states of matter. All matter is made up of particles called atoms, which are in turn made up of protons, neutrons and electrons. Atoms come together to form molecules, which are the building blocks for all types of matter. Therefore, the nature of the interaction between these atoms and molecules determines the state of matter. The first state we consider here is the solid state of matter. As an example of the solid state some salt crystals can be seen here. In a solid, particles are packed tightly together, and the chemical bonds prevent them from moving, allowing the particles to have only small vibrations. Atoms and molecules form some kind of lattice structure, as depicted in the figure. Amorphous materials are lack of such structure, but the chemical bonds can still keep the particles in their fixed position. Solids have a definite shape, mass, and volume, and do not conform to the shape of the container in which they are placed. The second state of matter is the liquid. In a liquid, the particles are more loosely packed than in a solid and they are able to flow around each other. As a result, any liquid has an indefinite shape, and it will conform to the shape of its container. Liquids have normally lower density than the solid form of matter, but they are still incredibly difficult to compress. The third state of matter is the gas. In a gas, the particles have great average distances between them and move freely in space. Therefore, a gas has no definite shape or volume, and without any confinement the gas particles will spread out indefinitely. If a gas is confined, it will expand to fill its container. By decreasing the volume of its container, the space between the gas particles can be reduced to a large extent, which means gases are much more compressible than solids or even fluids. The last state of matter we mention is the plasma, which can only be seen in electric charges on Earth, as it is shown in the picture. However, it may be the most common state of matter in the universe, since the plasma is abundant in stars or in accretion disks around black holes or compact stars. 
plasma consists of highly charged particles with extremely high kinetic energy. Like a gas, plasma does not have definite shape or volume since it is formed by ions and free electrons. Therefore, plasma has electric conductivity and it can produce and interact with electromagnetic fields. Matter does not necessarily stay in one state or another in nature, but there is a continuous transition between its states. If we heat or cool matter, we can produce phase transitions between the states of matter. By comparing the particle descriptions of the different states of matter with each other, we see that gas has the simplest model since the distance between the gas atoms or molecules is relatively large. This allows us to use an approximation, where we can neglect the interactions between the particles. Since a gas consists of electrically neutral particles, the Lorentz force does not complicate the description of the medium. Therefore, it is convenient to choose a gas as the simplest form of the matter to be the substance under study, when we introduce the basic concept of thermodynamics. In order to use a gas in a quantitative and qualitative analysis in the theory of heat, we provide a phenomenological model or description of the gaseous state of matter. First of all, we regard any gas as a continuous substance instead of using the particle description of this medium. In this picture, a gas fills the available space as a continuum without any gap or void. This approximation is valid, provided the characteristic distance of the system under our study is much larger than the average distance between the gas particles in the system. At the same time, this continuous substance is volatile. No free surface can be found in a gaseous volume, since this continuous medium fills up all the space in a container. Such a volatility is demonstrated by the yellow chlorine gas filling a whole test tube. Gases are also highly compressible when we compare them with fluids. If we seal air in a syringe and push in the plunger, we can compress the gas in it. Then the syringe can be used to fill the same amount of air to a balloon. We can see that the gas will extend a considerably greater volume in the balloon, demonstrating its high compressibility. Not only is the compressibility of gases much higher than the average density of fluids, but the density of gases is also much smaller than the average fluid density. We cannot mix air with water since the air bubbles always rise to the surface of the fluid. Pascal's law is valid for both fluids and gases. It states that if we close any liquid or gas in a container at rest, a pressure change in one part of medium is transmitted to the walls of the container without a loss to every portion of the substance. The pressure will be the same at every point of the wall encasing the substance, if the weight of the substance can be neglected. If a gas in a given volume has a considerable mass, as in the case of the atmosphere of the Earth, then an enormous column of gas exerts pressure on any object at the bottom of the column. The air pressure can be measured with special instruments called barometers, and the pressure distribution along the air column is given by the so-called barometric formula. These qualitative characteristics of a gas can be treated in a quantitative way by applying physical quantities to describe the state of a gas. Let us consider a container, vessel or cylinder filled with gas in a steady state. Then we can use the following quantities representing the physical state of the gas. The first one is the volume of the container, which is also the volume of the gas, since we have seen that a gas fills up all the available space in its container. The usual units for the gas volume are cubic centimeter, cubic decimeter and cubic meter. For one cubic decimeter we use the unit liter. The second quantity describing the state of the gas is the mass of the gas, which can be measured by weighting the container filled without and with gas, and subtracting the mass of the empty container from the mass of the filled one. The buoyant force must be also taken into account, and the mass of the filled container needs to be compensated with its corresponding value. The most frequently used units for mass are gram and kilogram. We have another important physical quantity which can be derived from these ones. This quantity is the density of the gas, that is the ratio of the mass of the gas to its volume. By definition, its unit is gram per cubic centimeter or kilogram per cubic meter. There is also a fundamental quantity, namely the amount of substance, which can be expressed as the ratio of the mass of the gas to its atomic or molecular mass. Its unit is called mole. The next physical property of a gas is the pressure, defined as the force per unit perpendicular area over which the force is applied. In the definition we can use the normal vector ds with the length of the area element, which has a direction perpendicular to the area element. We also use the infinitesimal force df exerted on the area element by the gas, which has the direction opposite of the normal vector ds. Then the pressure of a gas is just the derivative of the force f with respect to the area s on which the force is exerted. The gas pressure can be measured by barometers applying different principles. Pressure has a great variety of units, such as millimeter of mercury, atmosphere, bar, tor or pascal, 
that is Newton per square meter. The last quantity which might have the most intrinsic relation with the theory of heat is temperature. Temperature describes the thermal state of bodies or substances, and we can meet several phenomena of the release of heat in the everyday life, such as the radiation of the sun or the fire. Perhaps the most popular method for measurement of temperature is based on the effect of the thermal expansion of materials. When a body with a given volume is heated, its size and volume increase in a small increment. The amount of this increase or expansion of its volume can be used to measure the temperature of the body and its environment. The instruments designed to measure temperature are called thermometers. We will also give short overview on these devices and how they operate. The most frequently used units of temperature are centigrade or Celsius, Fahrenheit and Kelvin. These enlisted quantities can be classified into two categories, extensive and intensive properties. Extensive properties depend on the amount of matter that is present in a system. An extensive property is considered additive for subsystems. The examples for such a property among the quantities introduced here are volume, mass and the amount of substances. Intensive properties are bulk properties, which means they do not depend on the amount of matter that is present. Examples of intensive properties include, density, pressure and temperature. Now we have introduced and classified the basic physical quantities which are used to describe the physical state of gases. It is more or less clear how to determine the extensive properties of a gas such as volume and mass. It is also straightforward to compute the density and the amount of substance, if the volume and the mass of the gas are given with its atom or molecule weight. But pressure and temperature are intensive properties, and it is not so obvious how to measure such quantities. Therefore, we present the basic concepts related to pressure and temperature either in a historical context or in the context of the everyday life. This helps us to understand how the measurement techniques have been developed for these quantities. Let us start with the history of the development of the ideas related to the first quantity pressure. The concept of pressure, although in an indirect form, was already a subject of study among the ancient Greeks. Parmenides, the founder of the Eleata school, might be the first in the Western thinking who is pondering about the vacuum or the void from the viewpoint of natural philosophy. He applied an ontological argument against the existence of the void in nature, stating that if the void existed then the space was not nothing but a something, which is a contradiction. However, Democritus and Lysippus, the Greek atomists had another view. They thought that the fundamental constituents of the world are the atoms and the void. The void is the nothing or the negation of the body, and atoms move in the void and are separated by the void. Aristotle, following Parmenides rejected the existence of the void. He rephrased the ontological argument but also provided another one based on some principles in physics. He stated that if the void appeared somewhere due to the rarefaction of the matter, then the denser material would immediately fill the gap. As a result, vacuum does not exist. Aristotle's view on the non-existence of vacuum was supported throughout the scholastic tradition, and his tenet was rephrased in the Latin sentence, Nature of hard vacuum, or Nature of whores of vacuum by Franco's Rabialis, a Renaissance physician and scholar in his famous novel, Gargantua and Pantagruel. Later on, this principle was known as horror vacui. One of the first issues related to the principle of horror vacui is dated back to the early 1600s, when Cosimo de' Medici, the Duke of Tuscany had a well dug so that water could be pumped from it for irrigation purposes. His craftsmen used a suction pump, which is based on a simple principle depicted in this figure. Here we can see the cross section of a suction pump, which has a cylinder with an inlet at the bottom and an outlet in the right-hand side. The cylinder contains a piston with holes covered by flat valves at the top surface of the piston. The piston separates the volume of the cylinder two parts, the upper part above the piston and the lower part under the piston. If the piston is moved downward, the water from the lower part of the cylinder can flow through the holes by opening the flat valves and fills the upper part of the cylinder. If the piston is raised, the flow of the water closes the flap valves preventing itself from flowing back to the lower part of the cylinder. The rising piston can pump the water through the outlet, and at the same time produces suction on the fluid in the lower part, which raises water through the inlet from the well. This simple but efficient method was used by the craftsmen of the Duke to draw water from a well. However, there was a problem with this method, since the water could only be risen to the limit of 33 feet, that is about 10 meters in the pump. The Duke communicated this problem to Galileo Galilei is shown in the picture assisting to the Duke at the well, who was his scientific advisor. He attempted to give an explanation of this surprising phenomenon, which is based on the principle of horror vacui. Galileo published his last work under the title Discorsi in 1638, where he presented an experiment for the study of the so-called force of the vacuum. 
His basic idea was that the vacuum prevents each part of the liquid from separation, which he demonstrated with a simple experiment shown in the figure. A cylinder was filled with water and closed with a piston, then the cylinder was turned upside down. Since the piston prevented the water from pouring out of the cylinder, a bucket of water could be suspended from the end of the piston. As a result, the weight of the bucket produced a force pulling down the piston. If the bucket of water was not heavy enough, then it could not pull the piston since, as Galileo explained, the force of the vacuum does not let separate the parts of water from each other in the cylinder, and this force can hold the bucket. If more water was poured in the bucket, its weight could exceed the limit where the force of the vacuum was not able to hold the weight any more, and the piston fell down. According to Galileo, this limit of the force of the vacuum explains the limitation of the suction in the pump. He considered the weight at the limit as a quantitative measure of the vacuum. Galileo was the first scientist in history who associated a physical quantity, namely force with the phenomenon of vacuum. This was an important step in the understanding of the concept of pressure. His explanation has a remarkable consequence. The force of the vacuum acting on every part of the fluid is proportional to the size of the void which would appear as we reach the limit, where the force of vacuum is not able to hold the parts of the fluid together. Galileo's theory on vacuum gave a satisfactory explanation of this problem for many of his contemporary scholars. Nevertheless, the real reason of the existence of the suction limit was already known in 1628. Isaac Bateman, a Dutch scientist stated that it is the air which can only push the water up to 10 meters in the pump. Therefore, it had not taken so long to establish the correct interpretation of Galileo's experiment studying the force of vacuum. It was even Galileo's pupil, Evangelista Taricelli, who carried out his famous experiment refuting the principle of horror vacui once and for all. The experiment was remarkably simple. He sealed about a meter long glass tube at one end, filled it with mercury, and then inverted it into a dish filled with mercury, as shown in the figure. The mercury in the dish was also sealed with a layer of water floating on it. Some amount of the liquid drained out of the glass tube into the dish, but most of it remained in the tube. Torricelli explained this result by assuming that mercury drains from the glass tube until two forces exactly balance each other. These are the force produced by the weight of the column of mercury pushing down on the inside of the tube, and the force of the atmosphere pushing down on the surface of the liquid outside the tube. He also demonstrated that the mercury level in the tube is independent of the shape of the tube, that is the volume of the vacuous space above the mercury column. This observation refutes the hypothesis of the force of vacuum since if such a force existed, then it would be proportional to the volume of the vacuum. Repeated experiments showed that the average pressure of the atmosphere at sea level is equal to the pressure of a column of mercury 760 mm tall. The height of the mercury level can be derived from the force balance between its weight and the pressure force of the air. On one hand, the pressure force is given by the air pressure times the area of the surface over which we measure the pressure force. This area is equal to the cross-section of the glass tube, and it is denoted by A. On the other hand, the weight of the mercury column is the product of the mass m of the column and the gravitation acceleration g. The mass m is the product of the density rho of the mercury and the volume v of the column, where the volume is the product height h and the area a of the cross section of the column. By equating the two sides, we obtain the balance equation which can be divided by a. As a result, we have expressed the air pressure p as the product of the density rho of mercury, the gravitational acceleration g and the height of the mercury column h. A fast checking of the units shows this equation is consistent, providing Newton per square meters, the unit of pressure. This formula states that the pressure of a given substance in a container measured at a given location is proportional to the height of the substance in the container. Therefore, the height of the mercury column can be used as a unit measuring the pressure at a given point on the Earth's surface. A standard unit of pressure known as the standard atmosphere was defined as the pressure exerted by 760 mm of mercury at zero Celsius in standard gravity. Other units are also introduced for pressure, such as Pascal, which is the SI unit of pressure denoting Newton per square meter, the unit tor called after Torricelli, where one tor is equal to the 760th fraction of one atmosphere, or bar, where one bar is about 10 to 5 atmosphere. This table shows the conversion factors between the most popular units of pressure. Torricelli's success in producing the first artificial vacuum impressed Otto von Guericke, a German physicist, who created the first vacuum pump in the world shown in the picture. In his famous experiment with the so-called Magdeburg hemispheres, von Guericke wanted to demonstrate the Earth's enormous atmospheric pressure. In 1654 he performed his experiment for the first time in the Diet of Regensburg, and he repeated his demonstration two years later in Magdeburg, 
the city after which the hemispheres are named. He constructed two hemispheres that perfectly fitted to form a complete sphere with a diameter of 22 inches, which can also be seen in the picture. Then he attached his vacuum pump to the closed sphere and pumped the air out of the enclosure. As a result, the pressure difference between the atmospheric pressure outside of the sphere and the low pressure inside of the sphere produced an enormous force, firmly keeping the two halves together. In order to demonstrate this force, he applied animal force in his experiment. In Magdeburg, two teams of eight horses tried to pull these two halves apart, as depicted in this drawing, but they failed. In a later attempt, even 20 horses were unable to overcome the atmospheric pressure, which is not surprising at all if we calculate the force required to pull apart the hemispheres. Since pressure is defined as the force acting perpendicularly on the surface of any object per unit area, this force can be written as the pressure P times the area A of the surface on which the force is exerted. The area A is given by the cross-sectional area of the hemispheres, which is equal to pi times the square of the radius or of the hemispheres. The difference in pressure corresponds to a force holding the hemispheres together is approximately the atmospheric pressure, which is 101,325 pascals. Since the radius of the hemispheres is 11 inches, their cross-sectional area is equal to pi times the square of 0.2794 meters. Then the necessary force to overcome the atmospheric pressure is about 24,850 newtons with a sphere of this size, which is an enormous amount of force. We can see that if we calculate the mass of a body equivalent to this weight, this mass is given by the ratio of the force F to the gravitational acceleration g, that is 9.81 meter per second squared. Then the mass is equal to about 2.5 tons, which demonstrates how much force is needed to separate the hemispheres. Blaise Pascal, a French mathematician, physicist and philosopher also learned of Torricelli's experiment with the vacuum and he reproduced his experiment in 1647. Pascal wanted to understand what force keeps some mercury below the vacuum in the tube held upside down in a bowl of mercury. Like Bakeman almost 20 years earlier, he came to the idea that the force which keeps the mercury column at 760 mm is the weight of the air above the surface of mercury in the bowl. Based on this explanation, this force must be reduced on the top of a mountain by the weight of the air between the valley and the mountain. He predicted that the height of the column would decrease, which he proved with his experiments at the mountain Puy de Dome in central France. From the decrease he could calculate the weight of the air, and stated that this force measured at any place on the Earth's surface is the weight of the atmosphere above the given place. Pascal called this force pressure, and he claimed that it is acting uniformly in all directions. This is Pascal's law, which we have already mentioned. A steady-state gas with negligible weight in a closed container exerts the same pressure on all the parts of the walls of the container. There are several families of barometers based on their operational principles. The most traditional group of barometers are of course the mercury barometers using the technique introduced by Torricelli. Gay-Lussac's barometer is a mercury barometer, which uses a siphon for the measurement of pressure. The name siphon is applied to barometers of which the lower end of the tube is turned up to form a short arm. This short arm constitutes the cistern, and is left open. The instrument has two scales with a common zero point, and is graduated in contrary directions. The difference between the two levels of mercury gives the true height of the mercury column. The surface of the mercury in the lower arm corresponds to the zero point in the cistern barometer. Since the surface of the mercury fluctuates in the cistern and the longer limb, it is necessary to use a vernier at the ends of them, and take two readings in order to determine the height of the column. The next mercury barometer is Fortin's barometer, which consists of a narrow glass tube of length about 90 centimeters, closed at one end. The tube is completely filled with mercury and kept inverted in a cistern filled with dry mercury. The glass tube is usually enclosed in a brass tube for protection. The upper part of the brass tube has a slit that enables the level of the mercury in the glass tube to be seen. A scale graduated in millimeters is attached to the brass tube, and it functions as the main scale. A vernier scale that can slide over the main scale is also fixed to the barometer for accurate measurement. The vernier scale can be moved up and down using a screw. A bag is attached to the bottom of the cistern which is made of flexible leather. We can change the level of the mercury column in the cistern with the flexible bottom by adjusting the screw under it. There is an ivory pointer in the cistern placed at the top, and the tip of this pointer coincides with the zero of the main scale. The level of the mercury column in the cistern is so adjusted by the screw, that the ivory pointer is exactly at the surface of the mercury in the cistern. Any change in the atmospheric pressure changes the level of the mercury in the glass tube. As the height of the mercury column in the barometer changes, mercury flows between the tube and the cistern, which also changes the mercury level in the cistern. 
To determine the length of the mercury column in the barometer, we need to know the position of the free surface in the cistern and the tube. First, we set the level of the mercury in the cistern by using the adjustment screw such that the ivory pointer just touches the mercury. The top of the mercury column is then measured by reading both the main scale and the vernier scale. Before the readings are noted, the vernier scale has to be adjusted so that its edge and the corresponding reading in the main scale just set tangentially to the meniscus. Then the readings on the main scale and the vernier scale are noted, and the atmospheric pressure is calculated. Fortin's barometer is widely used in laboratories and in meteorological departments, since it is portable and it allows the mercury level in the cistern to be set to zero, which makes the reading more accurate. The next group of barometers is known as the family of aneroid barometers. The Greek word aneroid means without liquid, indicating that this type of instruments do not use mercury to measure pressure. The first aneroid barometer presented here is the Vidi barometer, which is a measuring device with a flexible airtight metal box, called aneroid capsule. A spring is installed in the capsule preventing it from collapsing. As the air pressure rises or falls, the box either squashes inward or flexes outward. The expansion and contraction of the capsule move the pointer on the dial. The dial is calibrated so we can read the air pressure instantly by knocking the glass face of the barometer. That is important, since the pointer shows the pressure as it was when we last looked at it. If we knock the glass then the pointer will jump to a new position showing the current air pressure. Aneroid barometers are used in homes and in meteorology stations, mostly installed in barographs. Another type of aneroid barometer is the board and tube pressure gauge. The board and tube is a C-shaped tube with an almost rectangular or elliptical cross-section, and it is usually made of stainless steel or phosphor bronze. If we want to use the pressure gauge, we connect the board and tube to any gas container or fluid pipe. When the pressure inside the tube increases the closed end of the tube opens out, Thus the displacement of the closed end becomes a measure of the pressure. As the boarding tube changes its shape, it rotates a shaft via gearing and causes a pointer to move across a properly calibrated scale on a dial. Such instruments are robust and typically used for pressures in the range 10 kPa to 100 MPa with an accuracy of about plus minus 1% of full scale. The other intensive quantity, which is perhaps the most relevant one in the theory of heat, is temperature describing the thermal conditions of bodies. In everyday activity, we use a broad classification of such thermal conditions with the categories cold, warm, and hot. This classification is completely based on sensory perception, which does not provide a strict criterion for quantitative purposes. However, we also know several natural phenomena which help us to establish a quantitative specification of temperature. The first one is the fact that the properties of bodies depend on their temperature. The effect of thermal expansion modifies their size, that is their length or volume. At the same time, other mechanical properties of bodies can also change when their thermal state changes, for example the density or the elasticity of a body. But other quantities related to the structural properties of matter also change due to the variation of temperature, like electric resistance or refractive index. This demonstrates that a wide range of material properties can be applied to describe the thermal state of bodies, and used in some method to measure temperature. Another experience helping us give a quantitative description of temperature is the fact that bodies in direct contact with each other reach thermal balance, provided no phase transition or chemical reaction is involved. That is, if we bring cold and hot bodies into a direct contact with each other, then the hot body cools down and the cold one warms up, both reaching a common, warm thermal state. We can say that they equalize their temperature and reach a thermal balance with each other. The third fact which can also be applied to measure temperature is that some special thermal states with given temperatures can be reproduced in nature. Such a special thermal state is the state of the melting ice or the boiling water for a given pressure. Both states have given temperatures, which allows us to construct an instrument properly calibrated for the measurement of temperature. These three facts of experience provide an objective basis for the quantitative description of temperature, which is independent of our sensory perception. All the instruments we present here apply these natural phenomena to measure temperature. Based on the principle of the measurement, we talk about several different types of thermometers. Here we present the most popular types of these instruments. The most common thermometers are the liquid and glass thermometers, which are based on the principle of thermal expansion of substances. The liquid and glass thermometer has a glass bulb attached to a sealed glass tube, called capillary. The bulb is typically filled liquid, which can expand and contract in the capillary. The liquid rises up into the tube when the temperature increases, and moves down the tube when the temperature decreases. A calibrated scale running along the capillary is used to read off the respective temperature that led to the corresponding thermal expansion. 
The range of such thermometers is limited by the liquid and the glass. The liquids must have a low freezing point and a sufficiently high boiling point so that they do not freeze at low temperatures and do not vaporize at high temperatures. Furthermore, the liquid must expand evenly with the temperature in the measuring range so that we could use a scale of even division. The commonest liquids are mercury and mercury thallium alloy. Organic liquids are used in thermometers for lower temperatures but they suffer from drainage problems associated with the low surface tension of the liquids and from vaporization. The table shows some of the liquids used in thermometers with the range of measurement for the corresponding liquid. The measuring sensitivity of liquid in glass thermometers increases with the amount of liquid in the thermometer. However, the heating or cooling of much liquid will take longer, which causes the thermometer to react very slow to temperature changes. Liquid and glass thermometers are usually calibrated against a standard thermometer and at the melting point of water. During calibration, the thermometer must be correctly immersed in the calibration bath to ensure the liquid reaches the thermal balance with the so that it could equalize its temperature with the bath. The next group of thermometers presented here are bimetallic thermometers. Such thermometers are based on the principle that different metals expand at different rates as they are heated. The main component of this type of thermometers is a bimetallic strip, which consists of two different metal strips having different coefficients of thermal expansion. The two metal strips typically used are steel and copper, or steel and brass. The spiral-shaped strips are connected along their length by fusing them together, as seen in the figure on the left-hand side. They are fixed at one end and free to move on the other end. Since their thermal expansion is different, the length of these metals changes at different rates for the same temperature. When the temperature rises or decreases, the strip will turn in the direction of metal with the lower or higher temperature coefficient respectively. The deflection of the strip indicates the temperature variation. This bending motion is converted by a spring attached to the free end of the strip. The spring is connected to pointer in the dial, which can be properly calibrated. The figure on the right-hand side shows such a measuring device. Bimetallic thermometers work typically up to 300 Celsius to within plus minus 1% of the scale range. However, they have a rather slow response, and require the whole of the sensing element to be immersed in the substance whose temperature is being measured. Bimetallic thermometers are the basic parts of air conditioners, ovens, and refrigerators, but they are also widely used in industry. Gas-filled temperature gauges or gas and metal thermometers are the next group of instruments measuring temperature which we present here. Such thermometers measure temperature by measuring the pressure exerted by a definite amount of gas enclosed in a constant volume. The pressure of a dilute gas at a constant volume is determined only by the temperature. If we measure the pressure of the gas in a sealed container with a constant volume, then we can determine the temperature of the gas and its environment. This container is normally a Borden tube used in barometers, as seen in the figure on the left-hand side. The Borden tube is connected to a bulb as the actual measuring probe. The entire system is sealed gas tight on all sides. If the gas inside the bulb is heated, the pressure increases because the gas cannot expand. The Borden tube bends due to the pressure, which serves as a measure of the temperature and can be read off a calibrated scale. Gas-filled thermometers can also be equipped with a flexible capillary tube for covering large distances. Such an equipment is shown in the figure on the right-hand side. In the case of large heights to be covered, the relatively large overpressure in the measuring system minimizes the influence of the hydrostatic pressure on the measurement result. Due to the relatively low heat capacity of gases, gas thermometers react relatively fast to temperature changes compared to liquid and metal thermometers. However, gas thermometers are more expensive than liquid and metal thermometers due to their more complex design. Depending on the thermometric gas, temperatures down to minus 200 Celsius or up to over plus 700 Celsius can be measured with a gas thermometer. The last type of thermometer we mention here is the thermoelectric or the thermocouple thermometer. Thermoelectric devices consist of a circuit having two wires of different metals, for example copper and iron. These wires are called thermocouple. They are welded together at one end, and call the hot or measuring junction at a temperature T. The other ends of the wires are the cold or reference junctions, and are maintained at a constant reference temperature T ref, which is usually 0 Celsius. The cold junctions are connected to a voltmeter operating at room temperature, as seen in the figure on the left-hand side. The temperature difference between the measurement junction and the reference junctions is determined from a measurement of the difference in the thermoelectric potentials developed along the wires. The presence of a temperature gradient in a metal or alloy wires leads to an electric potential gradient along the wires. This thermoelectric potential gradient or electromotive force is different in different metals and alloys for the same temperature gradient, that allows the effect to be used for the measurement of temperature. By measuring the electromotive force with the voltmeter, 
we can determine the temperature difference between the two ends of the wires, and therefore the temperature at the measurement junction. A simple thermocouple thermometer is shown in the photo on the right-hand side. Thermoelectric thermometers are capable of being used to directly measure temperatures up to 2600 Celsius. The junction of the thermocouple can be grounded and brought into direct contact with the measured material. Nevertheless, temperature measurement with a thermocouple involves the measurement of two temperatures, at the measuring junction and the reference junctions. Furthermore, the relationship between the process temperature and the thermocouple signal is not linear, which makes the calibration of the device more complicated. Here we present Boyle's Law as the first one of the gas laws. Boyle's Law formulates the everyday experience related to the compressibility of gases, which is very high compared to the one of liquids. A gas has a high compressibility if a small amount of change in pressure causes for the gas to have a great change in volume at a constant temperature. For example, we can consider a mini syringe pumping air in a balloon. If we compress air in a syringe to a small volume, we can pump the same amount of gas into the balloon. As a result, the gas will expand and inflates the balloon. Historically, Richard Townley and Henry Power were the first researchers in 1661 who tried to establish the barometric formula. They measured the air pressure on different altitudes along a hillside by using a Torricelli-type barometer, and they were able to establish a relationship between the pressure and the density of air. Powell published the results of their measurement in his book with the title Experimental Philosophy. Boyle saw the early draft of the book and have discussions with Townley. In the following year, Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke carried out a series of experiments related to the measurements made by Townley and Power. In the experiments, Boyle confirmed their findings. Hooke built a set of experimental apparatus shown in the figure. One of the devices in the picture is a J-shaped glass tube immersed in water bath, in which air was sealed with different amounts of mercury. Boyle demonstrated with the device that the pressure of the air is inversely proportional to its volume. However, Boyle was not the only one who carried out experiments to find this kind of relationships between the physical properties of the air. In 1679, Edmi Mario discovered Boyle's results as well. He also showed that the volume of a gas changes with its temperature, which is another important result related to another gas law. Now we present Boyle's experiment in which he determined the relationship between the pressure and the volume of a gas at a constant temperature. We will use an apparatus somewhat different from Hooke's J-shaped glass tube, but the principle of the measurement is the same. Let us connect two glass tubes with a rubber tube and form a U-shaped tube. The glass tube forming the left arm of the U-shaped tube has a tap which is left open. We pour some mercury into tubes so that the upper surfaces of the mercury column are located at the levels A and A'. prime. By closing the tap, we close the air over the mercury column in the left arm of the tube. The air enclosed in the space between the tap and the mercury column with the height A is indicated by the yellow color. Let us denote the volume of the enclosed space by V1, and the pressure of the air in this volume by P1, which is still the atmospheric pressure. That is, P1 is equal to 1 atmosphere or 76 centimeters of mercury. By elevating the right arm of the U-shaped tube, the mercury columns have the heights B and B' prime in the glass tubes. We lift the right arm in such a position, so that we could decrease the volume of the air enclosed in the space between the tap and the mercury to three-fourths of its original value. That is, the reduced volume, denoted with V2 is equal to three-fourths times V1. The difference between the heights B' prime and B of the mercury columns determines the pressure of the air closed in the reduced volume. The measured difference is about 25 centimeters. Then the pressure in the closed volume, denoted with P2 is given by the sum of 76 and 25 centimeters of the mercury levels. The ratio of P1 to P2 is equal to 76 divided by 76 plus 25, which gives 4 third. Therefore, P2 is equal to 4 third of the atmospheric pressure P1. As a result, the product of the pressure and the volume of the air remains constant, that is P1 times V1 is equal to P2 times V2. Now we lower the right arm of the U-shaped tube, so that the volume of the closed air column could increase to five-fourths of its initial volume. By denoting this increased volume with V3, we can see that V3 is equal to five-fourths times V1. The mercury columns have the heights of C and C' prime respectively, and the difference measured between the levels C' prime and C is 15 centimeters. The pressure of the air in the increased volume is denoted by P3. Then the ratio of P1 to P3 is given by 76 divided by 76 minus 15, which is equal to approximately five-fourths. As a result, the pressure P3 is equal to four-fifths times the pressure P1. That is, P1 times V1 is equal to P3 times V3. We have demonstrated that the product of the pressure and the volume of the air enclosed in the left arm of the U-shaped tube remains constant, 
regardless of its volume. Therefore, P1 times V1 is equal to P2 times V2, and also to P3 times V3. Then the experiment shows that the product of the pressure and the volume of a given amount of air is the same for an arbitrary volume or an arbitrary pressure. More accurate experiments demonstrate the same result with a gas under given circumstances. For example, we obtain this result for air with a pressure under 300 atmospheres at room temperature in a relatively big volume. Then Boyle's law discovered in 1662 states that, at a constant temperature, the product of the pressure and the volume of a gas with a given mass is constant. That is P times V is equal to a constant. This gas law can be rephrased in another form too. Since the density is equal to the ratio of the mass to the volume, and the mass is constant, the volume of a gas can be expressed in the terms of its density. Therefore, the gas law also states that the ratio of the pressure of a gas to its density is constant. The constant in the right-hand side of the gas law depends on the properties of the gas for a given temperature. We also note that Boyle's law is valid for a hypothetically perfect gas without any restriction. Such a gas is called ideal gas. That is, Boyle's law is a fundamental relation between the pressure and the volume of an ideal gas. Inversely, we can also define ideal gas as the gas that obeys Boyle's law. The gas law allows us to introduce a concept called isotherm. The isotherms are functional relations between the pressure and the volume of an ideal gas at a constant temperature. That is, we can express pressure as a function of volume for a constant temperature. Or we can determine its inverse function, in which we express volume as a function of pressure for a constant temperature. Boyle's law expresses this relation between the pressure and volume as the equation of a hyperbola. Then the isotherms of the ideal gas are hyperbolas in the pressure volume plot for given temperatures T1, T2 and so on, as shown in the plot. At a given temperature, the pressure of the gas is equal to the ratio of a constant divided by the volume of the gas. However, for each isotherm, that is for each hyperbola plotted for a given temperature, this constant is different. Let us consider now the isotherm compression of a given amount of ideal gas as an application of Boyle's law. In the isotherm compression, we reduce the volume of the gas and increase its pressure, while keeping its temperature constant. Describing the process in the terms of infinitesimal changes of these quantities, we can say that the change dp in the pressure of the gas is positive and the change dv in the volume of the gas is negative at a constant temperature t. Such a process can be performed in a cylinder with a moving piston compressing the gas in the cylinder, while we cool the system to keep it at a constant temperature. The initial state of the gas in the cylinder is the state A. Let the initial pressure and volume of the gas be P and V in this state. We can look up the constant temperature T from the pressure volume plot for the initial values of pressure and volume. The final state after the compression of the gas is the state B. The pressure and the volume of the gas in the state B will be P plus dP and V plus dV, respectively. The volumetric difference dV is negative in the case of compression. During the isotherm compression the gas changed its state from the initial state A to the final state B moving along the isotherm of the temperature T in the pressure volume plot, as we see in the figure. For such a process we can apply Boyle's law, which states that the product of the pressure and the volume of the ideal gas is the same in the initial state A and the final state B. That is, P times V is equal to P plus dP times V plus dV. The product in the right-hand side of this equation can be expanded as P times V plus P times dV, plus V times dP plus dV times dV. Here we neglect the last term, which is second order in the differentials of P and V, and keep the first three terms, which are equal to P times V in the left-hand side of this equation. Since the term P times V appears in both sides of the equation, it cancels out and we obtain that P times dV plus V times dP is equal to zero in the first order. By dividing this equation with dp times p, we obtain a differential equation for the derivative of the volume with respect to the pressure. That is, the derivative of the volume v of the ideal gas with respect to the pressure p is equal to the negative ratio of the volume v to the pressure p. It is an important relation, which can be written in another form if we introduce isothermal compressibility denoted by kappa. Kappa is defined as the partial derivative of the volume v with respect to the pressure p at constant temperature divided by the volume v. The negative sign is for having a positive value for kappa since the derivative is negative as we increase the pressure. We see from the definition of kappa that the volume V times the isothermal compressibility kappa determines the tangent of the isotherm in each point. If we substitute Boyle's law into kappa defined by minus 1 over V times the derivative of V with respect to P, it can be written as minus the ratio of P to a constant C, times the derivative of the ratio of the constant C to P. This expression gives 1 over P. 
Then we see that the isothermal compressibility of the ideal gas is just inversely proportional to the pressure of the gas. For example, the kappa of the air is 1 atmosphere to minus 1, and this value is much greater than the isothermal compressibility of water, which is 5 times 10 to the minus 5 atmosphere to minus 1. Another application of Boyle's law is the derivation of the barometric formula, which describes the variation of atmospheric pressure with altitude. Since the atmosphere is an enormous volume of gas at rest under the influence of gravity, the pressure due to the weight of the gas decreases as we move from a given reference level to higher altitudes. Let this rectangle represent a portion of the atmosphere from the ground to its upper limit, where its density drops to zero. Its color gradient between blue and white indicates the decrease of pressure in the air column as we reach higher altitudes. For the sake of simplicity, we suppose that the air column has constant temperature. Here we consider two level surfaces represented with the green lines at an arbitrary altitude in this atmospheric column, where delta H denotes a small distance between the surfaces. Let P and P plus delta P be the pressure values at the upper and lower surfaces, respectively. The density in the thin layer between the surfaces can be regarded as constant. The pressure P at the upper surface of the layer is obviously smaller than the pressure P plus delta P at the lower one. The difference delta P in the pressure at the top and the bottom surfaces can be given by the formula describing the pressure at the bottom of a column of substance with a given height, which we obtained for Torricelli's experiment. Then delta P is equal to minus the density rho, times the gravitational acceleration g, times the thickness delta H of the layer. The minus sign indicates that as the height H runs from a lower altitude to higher one, pressure decreases. Now we can divide the equation by delta H, while the distance between the two surface tends to zero. Then the left-hand side of the equation becomes the derivative of the pressure P with respect to the altitude H, which is equal to minus the density rho of the air times the gravitational acceleration G, both measured at the altitude H. This differential equation describing the variation of pressure also holds for liquids, which are nearly incompressible and their density is constant. However, in the case of air, there is a functional relation between density and pressure, both depending on the altitude h. For the isothermal condition, we can use Boyle's law in the form which tells that the ratio of the pressure to the density is constant. We can choose the reference pressure P0 and the density rho 0 at the surface of the earth. Then we write that the pressure P over the density rho is equal to the reference pressure P0 over the reference density rho 0. Here we can express rho as the ratio of rho 0 to P0 times P. If we substitute this expression into the differential equation we obtain that the derivative of the pressure P with respect to the height H is equal to minus the reference pressure, times the gravitational acceleration G over the reference density rho 0, times the pressure P. Here the factor of the pressure P on the right-hand side is constant, and we can integrate this differential equation with the boundary condition, which tells that the pressure P is equal to the reference pressure P0 at the surface of the Earth, that is at H equal to 0. The solution is the barometric formula, which states that the pressure P of the air is equal to the reference pressure P0 times the exponential of minus a constant times the height H, where the constant is the ratio of the product of the reference density rho 0 and the gravitational acceleration g to the reference pressure P0. By using Boyle's law, we can write the barometric formula in the terms of density as well, where the density of the air is equal to the reference density times the same exponential term. Therefore the barometric formula tells that the pressure and the density are exponentially decreasing with respect to the altitude in a gas at constant temperature. This expression describes the distribution of the pressure and the density along different altitudes in the atmosphere for an idealized case, where the variation of the temperature is negligible throughout the air column. In the plot we can see the air pressure normalized with the reference pressure versus the altitude H measured in kilometers. The plot clearly shows the exponential decrease of the pressure as we elevate ourselves from the Earth's surface at sea level. We see that at the altitude of about 6 kilometers, the pressure already drops to half of its value measured at sea level. When we exceed 20 kilometers in altitude, the pressure is only about one-tenth the atmospheric pressure at sea level. We can specify the reference values of the pressure and the density at sea level. The standard pressure P0 of air is equal to 101,325 pascals, whereas the standard density rho zero of air is equal to 1.225 kg per cubic meter, both measured at 15 Celsius. Then we obtain 1.1186 times 10 to minus 4 meter to minus 1 for the factor of the altitude h in the exponent of the barometric formula. With these values inserted into the formula, we can calculate the air pressure at an arbitrary altitude. For example, since the elevation or the snow height of Mount Everest is 8,848.86 meters, the barometric formula gives the pressure of 35.4 kilopascals on the summit. 
this value is close to the average pressure measured there, which is 33.7 kPa. That is, Everest summit has approximately one-third the air pressure that exists at sea level. We can demonstrate the variation of the pressure described by the barometric formula in a simple experiment with Ben's tube. This is a tube with two openings at its ends held in a horizontal position. If methane is pumped into the tube then the gas escapes through the openings. We light the escaping methane after all air has been displaced from the tube, so that we could prevent the gas from burning inside the tube. We will see that the flames have the same size at both ends of the tube, indicating that the same amount of gas flows through both the openings. We can explain this result with the fact that the difference between the pressure of methane and the pressure of air is the same at both the openings. When the tube is tilted, the upper flame becomes larger than the lower one. This shows that the pressure difference between the outside air and the methane leaving the tube is greater at the upper opening than at the lower one. Since the density of methane is smaller than the density of air, the rate of the decrease in pressure of methane with the altitude is smaller than the rate of decrease for the air pressure. These rates are determined by the barometric formula, and this experiment demonstrates that the pressure must decrease more rapidly in the heavier air than in the lighter methane. The second gas law we present here is Charles's law, which is related to the fact that air will expand if we heat it. More quantitatively, the thermal expansion of a gas means that a moderate increase in the gas temperature produces a considerable increase in the volume of the gas for a given pressure. Historically, Francis Hauxby was the first person who studied this effect and published his results in 1703. In his experiment, he heated air sealed with mercury or quicksilver in a siphon. The figure shows this simple experiment set up from his book, where the mercury drop is located at the position A in the glass tube of the siphon. He found in his measurements that the volume of the gas is proportional to its temperature for a given amount of air. In 1787, Jacques Charles performed a series of experiments. He heated different gases in five balloons with the same initial volume up to 80 Celsius. As a result, all the balloons expanded with the same amount of volume, that is the change of the gas volume was constant for a given increase of its temperature. The same effect was studied by John Dalton and Joseph Luskay lussac in 1801 and 1802. They demonstrated that gases expand by the same amount between 0 and 100 Celsius. However, no simple linear connection was established between the gas volume and temperature. Rather they found the formula stating the difference between the volume of the gas at 100 Celsius and the one at 0 Celsius is proportional to the initial volume at 0 Celsius. Here K is a proportionality factor. Our everyday experience shows that if we heat gas then it will expand, that is the gas increases its volume. Let us study this phenomenon with a simple experiment based on Hauxby's approach. We can examine the relation between the temperature and the volume of air quantitatively, if we keep its pressure constant during heating. In the experiment we use a siphon attached to a glass bottle, where the bottle is immersed in a water bath. The siphon has the diameter D and the radius R. We seal the air in the bottle with a mercury drop put in the siphon, which can move along the horizontal part of the glass tube. The air sealed with the mercury drop is represented by the yellow area, while the quicksilver is colored with gray in the figure. If the gas in the bottle reaches a thermal balance with the water bath, we can consider the state of the gas as an initial state. The initial volume and temperature of the air in the bottle and the sealed part of the siphon are V1 and T1 at a given pressure P. If we heat the water bath then we can increase the temperature of the air in the bottle. As the gas is getting warmer, it will expand and pushes the mercury drop outward in the siphon. The moving mercury drop in the siphon keeps the pressure of the expanding gas constant, like a moving piston in a cylinder. The warm air has the temperature T2, which is greater than the initial temperature T1. The pressure P of the gas in the bottle is constant and the volume of the expanded gas is V2, which can be written as the initial volume V1 plus delta V. The increase delta V in the volume of the air in the bottle and the siphon can be determined from the length delta L, which is the change in the horizontal position of the mercury drop, and the radius R of the siphon. Delta V is equal to the length delta L times the cross-sectional area of the siphon. Since it is a glass tube, we can write that delta V is equal to pi times the square of the radius R times the length delta L. For a given radius r, we immediately obtain the increase delta v of the volume of the gas by measuring delta l. We can repeat this experiment with different initial and final temperatures by determining the volumetric expansion of the gas at a constant pressure. The result of the series of experiments allows us to study the relationship between the temperature and the volume of air at a given pressure. This experiment is very simple and easy to perform, but we can use a more accurate method to determine this relationship. The method is based on the application of a more complicated apparatus, 
which allows us to study the change in the volume of a gas heated at a constant pressure. The apparatus consists of a container filled with mercury, which is connected to a piston in a cylinder and two vertical glass tubes. The left glass tube remains open and operates as a mercury barometer called manometer, and the right glass tube is connected to another container filled with a gas. The mercury in the right glass tube seals the gas in the container. The heights of mercury columns in the glass tubes can be controlled by moving the piston. Let us suppose that the gas is extended to the height A1 in the glass tube for the initial pressure P1 and the initial temperature T1 of the gas in the container. The height A1 determines the total volume of the gas sealed by the mercury column. The pressure P1 of the gas in the container also determines the height B1 of the mercury column in the manometer. The difference H of the heights B1 and A1 is proportional to the difference between the atmospheric pressure and the pressure of the gas. By heating the gas in the container, the temperature of the gas can be raised from the initial temperature T1 to a given temperature T2. The gas will expand and its pressure also increases, where P2 denotes the pressure of the warm gas. Since the expanding gas displaces some amount of mercury in the glass tube, the height of the mercury column drops to the level A2. At the same time this amount of mercury fills the manometer, and the height of the mercury column raises to the level B2. We can reduce the pressure of the gas in the container if we pump out more mercury from the glass tubes by moving the piston upward in the cylinder. In the final state of the system, the height of the mercury column in the glass tube is reduced to the level A3, and the height measured in the manometer is equal to B3. If we pump such an amount of mercury from the glass tube so that the difference of the heights B3 and A3 is equal to H, then we have restored the initial difference between the atmospheric pressure and the pressure in the container. Therefore, we restored the initial pressure P1 in the container whereas the temperature of the gas has remained T2. Since the pressure is the same in the initial and the final states, we can talk about the thermal expansion of the gas at a constant pressure. The initial and the final temperatures of the gas are T1 and T2, respectively. We only need to calculate the volumetric expansion of the gas during heating. The increase delta V in the volume of the gas is equal to the length A2 minus A3 times the cross-sectional area of the space in the glass tube, that is pi times the square of the inner radius R of the glass tube. If we perform this experiment with different pairs of initial and final temperatures of the gas in the container and measure the volumetric expansion of the gas for each pair, then we can compile a table from the data and study the relationship between the change of the temperature and the volumetric expansion of a gas. In order to achieve a precise measurement, we need to apply some corrections for the thermal expansion of the container in the different gas temperature in the glass tube connecting the manometer and the container. This method was applied by Amontons in 1703 and Gay-Lussac in 1802, who found the law for the thermal expansion of gases as a function of temperature. However, the general form of the law is known as Charles's law, which was discovered in 1789 by Charles, and it states the following. If the pressure of a gas is kept constant then the volume of the gas is a linear function of the gas temperature. That is, the volume V of the gas is equal to its initial volume V0 times 1 plus beta times the temperature T. Here beta is a proportionality factor and the temperature is written with a lower case letter indicating that it is measured in Celsius. Another form of this equation determines the relative change of the volume of the gas, that is the ratio of delta V to V0 where delta V is just the difference between V and the initial volume V0. Then the relative change delta V over V0 of the volume of the gas is proportional to the gas temperature measured in Celsius. The proportionality constant beta is called the volumetric heat expansion coefficient of the gas. Measurements were performed with heating different gases at a constant pressure and demonstrated that the volumetric heat expansion coefficient is universal, that is, it is the same for all gases. Its value is found to be 1 over 273.15 Celsius, which is equal to 0.003661 per Celsius. The initial volume V0 of the gas is measured at the temperature of 0 Celsius. The law claims that if we heat any gas so that its temperature increases from 0 Celsius to 1 Celsius, then the volume of the gas will expand by a factor of about 1 over 273. If the volume V1 of a gas is measured at the temperature T1, we can write that V1 is equal to V0 times 1 plus beta times T1. Since the volume V of the gas measured at the temperature T is equal to V0 times 1 plus beta times T, we can express V0 from the previous equation and substitute the result into this formula. Now the volume V is equal to the product of the ratio of V1 to 1 plus beta times T1 and the factor 1 plus beta times T. We can add beta times T1 to the terms in the numerator and at the same time subtract the same term from them. Then we obtain that V1 is multiplied by the factor 1 plus beta times T minus T1, 
divided by 1 plus beta times t1. As a result, we have a general form for the volumetric expansion of a gas at a constant pressure. If we measure the volume V1 of a gas at an arbitrary reference temperature T1, then the volume V of the gas at the temperature T is V1 multiplied by 1 plus the ratio of T minus T1 to 1 over beta plus T1. If we substitute the value of beta into this result, we obtain V1 times 1 plus the ratio of T minus T1 to 273.15 Celsius plus T1. The third gas law is called Gay-Lussac's law, which describes the everyday experience of heating a gas in a closed container. If we heat a gas stored in a closed container its pressure builds up, that is we increase the pressure of the gas in the container. In the photo we can see the failure of a high pressure vessel in hydrostatic testing, but we may have a similar result if we heat a great amount of gas in a small container with thin walls. The quantitative description of this effect is simply that the change in the temperature of a gas confined to a constant volume changes its pressure. This effect was studied systematically by Guillaume Amontins in 1699. Since he used Torricelli-type barometers shown in the figure from his publication, the results of his experiments could not be very accurate, and his analysis was at best semi-quantitative. Nevertheless, he could demonstrate that the pressure of a gas increases by roughly one-third between zero and 100 Celsius. His results also helped him to anticipate absolute zero, when he speculated about that a sufficient drop in the temperature may lead to the vanishing pressure of a gas. Joseph Louis Gay Lussac could perform more accurate measurements in 1802, when he studied the relationship between the temperature and the pressure of a gas confined in a container. The picture shows the apparatus used in his experiments. He was the first one, who formulated the third gas law stating that the pressure of the a given amount of gas increases linearly as the temperature of the gas rises, provided the volume of the gas is held constant. As mentioned before, he also demonstrated the second gas law, when he found that the volume of a given amount of gas measured at 0 degrees Celsius has an expansion by a factor of 1.37 at 100 degrees Celsius. In fact, we can perform the same experiment with some modifications to establish both the second and the third gas laws. Therefore, we use the apparatus presented in the demonstration of Charles's law, to study the change in the pressure of a gas while we heat the gas and keep its volume constant. The apparatus consists of a piston and a cylinder and a manometer which are connected to a container filled with a gas. Both the cylinder and the manometer are filled with mercury, which seals the gas in the container. The heights of mercury columns in the manometer and the glass tube leading to the container can be controlled by moving the piston. Let us suppose that the gas is extended to the height A1 in the glass tube for the initial temperature T1 and volume V1 of the gas in the container. The height A1 determines the total volume of the gas sealed by the mercury column. The pressure of the gas in the container also determines the height B1 of the mercury column in the manometer. The difference H1 of the heights B1 and A1 is proportional to the difference between the atmospheric pressure and the pressure of the gas. By heating the gas in the container, the temperature of the gas can be raised from the initial temperature T1 to a given temperature T2. The gas will expand and its volume increases to the volume V2. Since the expanding gas displaces some amount of mercury in the glass tube, the height of the mercury column drops to the level A2. At the same time this amount of mercury fills the manometer, and the height of the mercury column raises to the level B2. We can compress the gas in the container if we pump more mercury into the glass tubes by moving the piston downward in the cylinder. In the final state of the system, the height of the mercury column in the glass tube is increased to the level A3, and the height measured in the manometer is equal to B3. If we pump such an amount of mercury into the glass tube so that the height A1 is equal to the height A3, then we have restored the initial volume V1 of the gas in the container, whereas the temperature of the gas has remained T2. Here H3 is the difference between the length B3 and A3, which is not equal to H1. That is the difference between the atmospheric pressure and the pressure of the gas in the container is not the same in the initial and the final states. However, the volume of the gas is the same in the initial and the final states, and we can talk about the heating of the gas while its volume is held constant. The initial and the final temperatures of the gas are T1 and T2, respectively. We only need to calculate the increase in the pressure of the gas during heating. The height of the mercury column in the manometer measures the pressure in millimeters of mercury. Therefore, the increase delta P in the pressure of the gas is equal to the difference of the heights H3 and H1, which is measured in millimeters of mercury. If we perform this experiment with different pairs of initial and final temperatures of the gas in the container and measure the increase in the pressure of the gas for each pair, then we can compile a table from the data and study the relationship between the change of the temperature and the change of pressure of a gas. 
In order to achieve a precise measurement, we need to apply some corrections for the thermal expansion of the container and the different gas temperature in the glass tube connecting the manometer and the container. This method was applied by Gay Lussac in 1802, who formulated the third gas law known as Gay Lussac's law. Gay Lussac's law states the following. If the volume of a gas is held constant, then the pressure of the gas is a linear function of the gas temperature. That is the pressure P is equal to the reference pressure P0 times 1 plus beta prime times T. In other words, the ratio of the pressure change delta P to reference pressure P0 is equal to beta prime times T. The temperature T of the gas is measured in Celsius, as in the case of Charles's law. Here beta prime is called pressure coefficient, which is the same for all gases. That is, beta prime is a universal constant. It is equal to 1 over 273.15 Celsius, which is equal to 0.003661 per Celsius. P0 is the reference pressure, that is the pressure of the gas at 0 Celsius for a given volume. This formula tells us if we heat a gas closed in a constant volume from 0 Celsius to 1 Celsius, then its pressure P0 increases approximately by a factor of 1 over 273. We can also derive the general form of Gay Lussac's law in the same way as in the case of Charles's law. The general formula states the following. For a constant volume, the pressure P of a gas measured at the temperature T is equal to a reference pressure P1 of the gas measured at the temperature T1, times 1 plus the ratio of T minus to T1 to 1 over beta prime plus T1. Here T1 is an arbitrary reference temperature. We can also substitute the value of the pressure coefficient in the equation. We see that the pressure coefficient is equal to the volumetric expansion coefficient, that is beta prime is equal to beta, and the expansion or contraction factor in Gay Lussac's law is the same as the one in Charles's law. We have seen that the pressure coefficient is a universal constant, that is, beta prime is independent of the material properties of the gas. Therefore, Gay Lussac's law is valid for an ideal gas without any restriction, just like Boyle's law and Charles's law. Or the other way around, the ideal gas is defined as the gaseous substance for which Gay Lussac's law and the two first gas laws are valid. In the first two gas laws, we introduce the concepts isotherms and isobars. For the third gas law, we can define a third type functional relation between the physical properties of the ideal gas. This relation is represented by isochors, which are functional relations between the temperature and the pressure of an ideal gas for a constant volume. That is, we can express pressure as a function of temperature for a constant volume, when an ideal gas undergoes an isochord process. Or we can determine its inverse function, in which we express temperature as a function of pressure for a constant volume. From Gay Lussac's law, we see that isochors are lines in the temperature versus pressure plot for a given reference pressure P0 of the gas with a constant volume. The tangent of an isochord depends on the reference pressure P0, that is, the ratio of delta P to the temperature T is equal to the pressure coefficient beta primes times the initial pressure P0. Therefore, another reference pressure P0 prime gives another isochor with a different tangent. We also see that Gay Lussac's law, which describes the change in the state of a gas undergone an isochor process, does not have any explicit dependence on volume. In fact, we can combine the three gas laws into one gas law, which describes an explicit functional dependence between the temperature, the pressure, and the volume of an ideal gas. We will call this combined gas law the equation of state of an ideal gas. The apparatus used in the demonstration of Charles's law and Gay Lussac's law can help us to change the pressure and the volume of the gas enclosed in the container at the same time. Such an experiment demonstrates the following. If we change the pressure and the volume of a gas at the same time, then the temperature of the gas is uniquely determined by its pressure and volume. That is, the gas temperature T is a unique function of the pressure P and the volume V of the gas. It can also be shown that the volume of a gas is a unique function of the temperature and the pressure of the gas. We can establish a similar unique functional dependence of the pressure of the gas on its temperature and volume as well. Now we can say that the quantities temperature, volume and pressure describe the state of a given amount of gas, and we call these quantities the state variables of the gas. Then we can define the equation of state of a gas as a unique functional relation between the variables pressure, volume and temperature, measured in an arbitrary state of the gas. Such a function can be expressed in the following general form. The function f with the variables p, v, e, and t is equal to zero. This general form is known as the equation of the state of the gas. In order to derive the equation of state for an ideal gas, we consider a cylinder with a moving piston which is filled with a gas. In the initial state of the gas it has the temperature T0 which is equal to zero Celsius. 
the piston is in its initial position, where the gas has the volume V0 and the pressure P0. In the first step we perform an isobaric expansion of the gas. That is, we heat the gas in the cylinder and let the piston to move so that the expanding gas could keep the pressure P0. In the isobaric expansion we increase the gas temperature from T0 to T and its volume from V0 to V'. prime. For an isobaric process we can apply Charles's law, which states that the volume V' prime is equal to the initial volume V0 measured at 0 Celsius, times 1 plus the volumetric heat expansion coefficient beta times the temperature T. In the second step we perform an isothermal expansion of the gas, that is we expand the gas by moving the piston while we keep to the temperature of the gas constant. It is a good approximation of the isothermal expansion if we move the piston slowly. Then we increase the volume of the gas from the volume V' prime to its final volume V. Since the temperature of the gas is constant, the gas pressure drops from the pressure P0 to its final pressure P. For an isothermal process we can apply Boyle's law, which states that the product of the pressure P and then the volume V of the gas is equal to the pressure P0 times the volume V'. prime. Now we can eliminate the volume V' prime from this equation by substituting Charles's law in its right-hand side. Then the combined gas law states that the product of the pressure P and the volume V of a given amount of gas measured at the temperature T is equal to the reference pressure P0, times the reference volume V0, times 1 plus beta time the temperature T measured in Celsius. Here the coefficient beta is equal to 1 over 273.15 Celsius. Although we used only Boyle's law and Charles's law to derive this formula, it combines all the three gas laws. For an isothermal process the temperature of the gas is constant. That is the temperature T is equal to the initial temperature T0. Since it is equal to 0 Celsius taken as a reference temperature, the combined gas law reduces to Boyle's law stating that P times V is equal to P0 times V0. In the case of an isobaric process the pressure of the gas is constant, that is the pressure P is equal to the initial pressure P0. Then the combined gas law reduces to Charles's law, stating that V is equal to V0 times 1 plus beta times T. For an isochoric process the volume of the gas is constant, that is the volume V of the gas is equal to the initial volume V0. Then the combined gas law reduces to the equation stating that P is equal to P0 times 1 plus beta times T. Since the volumetric heat expansion coefficient introduced in Charles's law is equal to the pressure coefficient of Gay-Lussac's law, this equation is equivalent to Gay-Lussac's law. That is, the combined gas law reduces to Gay-Lussac's law for an isochoric process. Since the mass of a given amount of gas is constant during the change of its state, the ratio of the volume V of the gas to its initial volume V0 is equal to the ratio of its density rho to its initial density rho 0. If we substitute this result in the combined gas law, we can write that the ratio of the gas pressure to the density of the gas is equal to the ratio of the reference pressure to the reference density, times 1 plus beta times the temperature measured in Celsius. In the combined gas law we use reference values of the different properties of an ideal gas. We can choose the state of the gas in which the reference values V0, P0 and rho 0 are measured at the reference temperature T0. For thermodynamics calculations, the so-called standard conditions are introduced for temperature and pressure, which are also known as standard temperature and pressure, or STP. Standard temperature and pressure are defined to be 0 Celsius in one atmosphere or 101.325 kPa. Another definition is also in use, where the standard pressure is 100 kPa. STP describes standard conditions introduced to measure gas density and volume using the ideal gas law. At standard conditions, one mole of an ideal gas occupies 22.41 liters. We can examine the validity of the combined gas law if we factor out beta from the parenthesis in the equation. Then the product of the pressure P and the volume V is equal to the ratio of the product of P0 and V0 to 273.15, times 273.15 Celsius plus the temperature T measured in Celsius. This is an equation of a line in the plot of the gas temperature versus the product of the pressure and volume of the gas. The line crosses the ordinate at the value P0 times V0, the product of the pressure and the volume of the gas measured at 0 Celsius. At minus 273.15 Celsius, the sum of the terms in the parenthesis is equal to 0, that is the line crosses the abscissa at that temperature. As a result, the product of the pressure and the volume vanishes at at minus 273.15 Celsius. Therefore, either the pressure or the volume of the ideal gas drops to zero at this low temperature, as suggested by Amontons in his speculations on the behavior of gases exhibiting at low temperatures. Such a drop in pressure or volume does not happen in reality. 
At low temperatures we experience the condensation of real gases, where they turn to liquid phase at a low temperature. It is clear that the gas laws do not describe the behavior of liquids and the combined ideal gas law is not valid at very low temperatures. However, the temperature where the pressure or the volume of an ideal gas falls to zero, is an important concept, which leads us to introduce the thermodynamic or absolute temperature scale in thermodynamics. From statistical and quantum mechanics we know that minus 273.15 Celsius is the lowest possible temperature in nature, and this temperature is called absolute zero. Then we can introduce a temperature scale for which we choose this lowest possible temperature as a zero. That is, the temperature T written with a capital letter is called thermodynamic or absolute temperature, and it is equal to 273.15 Celsius plus the temperature T measured in Celsius. Absolute temperature is measured in Kelvin. In the left-hand side of the figure we can see the Celsius scale, and the absolute temperature scale is presented in its right-hand side. The figure illustrates the simple fact that the absolute temperature scale is basically the Celsius scale shifted by 273.15 degrees. We also give some examples of typical temperatures measured in both temperature scales. The freezing point of water at 0 Celsius is 273.15 Kelvin, and the boiling point of water is at 100 Celsius, which is 373.15 Kelvin. Room temperature is normally around 20 and 25 Celsius, and this range is between about 293 and 298 Kelvin in the absolute temperature scale. In practice, any temperature around 300 Kelvin can be considered as room temperature. Since the Kelvin scale is just a shift of the Celsius scale, it is very convenient to describe differences in temperature with respect to these temperature scales. That is, we do not need to convert temperature differences between the Celsius and Kelvin scales. The thumb rule is very simple. Whenever we have a temperature difference x Celsius, it corresponds to the temperature difference x Kelvin in the absolute scale. However, the application of the absolute temperature scale is very convenient in the case of the ideal gas law. Let us express the combined gas law in the terms of absolute temperature. We have seen that the combined gas law states that the product of the pressure P and the volume V is equal to the ratio of the product of the reference pressure P0 and the reference volume V0 to 273.15 Celsius, multiplied by 273.15 Celsius plus the temperature T measured in Celsius. The expression within the parentheses is just the absolute temperature defined as the Celsius scale shifted by 273.15 Celsius. Then we can write that the product of the pressure P and the volume V is equal to the ratio of the product of the reference pressure P0 and the reference volume V0 to the constant T0, multiplied by the absolute temperature. The constant T0 is equal to 273.15 Celsius, the temperature at which the reference pressure P0 and the reference volume V0 are measured for a given amount of gas. Since Boyle's law states that the product of the pressure and the temperature of a given amount of gas is constant in an isothermal process, the product of the reference pressure P0 and the reference volume V0 is constant at 0 Celsius. Therefore, the expression P0 times V0 divided by 273.15 degrees is also constant. As a result, we can write the combined gas law in the following form. The ratio of the product of the pressure P and the volume V to the absolute temperature T is equal to the ratio of the product of the reference pressure P0 and the reference volume V0 to the constant T0. Here C, defined by the ratio of P0 times V0 to T0 is a constant for a given amount of ideal gas. Then the combined gas law has the following form. The product of the pressure P and the volume V of an ideal gas is equal to C times the absolute temperature T of the gas. We have not talked about real gases yet, but we already know that the combined gas law is an approximation of the behavior of the real gases. The lower the pressure and higher the temperature of the real gas are, the better the approximation is. Hence, the concept of an ideal gas is based on the validity of the combined gas law. We define an ideal gas as a gaseous substance for which the combined gas law is valid without any restriction. That is, the combined gas law is valid for an ideal gas in any range of pressure and temperature of the gas. As a result, the ideal gas law states that the product of the pressure P and the volume V of an ideal gas with the given mass is proportional to the absolute temperature of the gas, that is the pressure P times the volume V is equal to a constant C times the absolute temperature T. Now we determine the proportionality constant C. We define C as the ratio of the product of the reference pressure P0 and the reference volume V0 to the constant T0. 
the gas law states that the constant C is equal to the pressure P of a gas times its volume V divided by its absolute temperature T. If we consider the units of the quantities in fraction, we see that the unit of the constant C is Pascal times cubic meter per Kelvin, which is equal to Newton meter per Kelvin or Joule per Kelvin. Since C is a constant for a given type of gas with a given mass, C is proportional to the mass M of the gas. In the table we show that a gas with the mass M has the volume V0 at standard conditions, that is at 0 Celsius and 1 atmosphere. At the same reference temperature and pressure, the same type of gas with 2 times greater mass occupies 2 times the volume of the original amount of gas, that is the gas with the mass of 2 times M has the volume 2 times V0. Therefore, we can split the constant C into two factors, the factor R S called the specific Regnault constant of a given type of gas, and the mass M of the gas, where we assume that our S does not depend on the mass of the gas. Since the specific Regnault constant is equal to C divided by M, we can express it as the ratio of the product of the pressure P and the volume V of the gas to the product of its mass M and its absolute temperature T. Then the unit of the specific Regnault constant is Pascal times cubic meter per kilogram times Kelvin. As the name of the specific Regnault constant indicates it is specific for each type of gas, that is, it depends on the properties of the given gas. However, we can use a universal constant instead of the specific one, if we measure the amount of matter in moles. By definition, one mole matter contains approximately 6.022 times 10 to 23 atoms or molecules, and this number is known as Avogadro number. We also use the definition of the molar mass of matter denoted by M with the subscript M, that is molar, which is the ratio of the mass M to the amount N of matter, and it measures matter in the units of kilogram per mole. We have already seen that one mole ideal gas at 0 Celsius, and atmospheric pressure occupies 22.414 liters. Now we can define the universal gas constant or Regnault constant R as the product of the molar mass and the specific Regnault constant of the given type of gas. If we substitute the definitions of the molar mass and the specific Regnault constant in this expression, we obtain that R is equal to the ratio of the pressure P times the volume V to the amount N of the gas times the temperature T. Now we can substitute the volume of one mole gas measured at 0 Celsius and atmospheric pressure in this equation. Then we have 1.013 times 10 to 6 pascals times 2.2414 cubic meter per 1 mole times 273.15 Kelvin. The result is 8.3145 joule per Kelvin. This is the value of the universal gas constant, which does not depend on the properties of the given gas. Since the proportionality constant C is the product of the specific Regnault constant R S and the mass M of the gas, C is equal to the mass of the gas times the universal gas constant R, divided by the molar mass of the gas. The ratio of the mass to the molar mass is just the amount N of substance, therefore the proportionality constant is equal to the amount N of the gas times the universal gas constant R. If we substitute the result in the combined gas law, we obtain its final form which we call ideal gas law or the equation of state for ideal gas. Then the ideal gas law determines the equation of state for n mole ideal gas occupying the volume V at the pressure P and the absolute temperature T, which is the following. The pressure P times the volume V is equal to the amount N of the gas, times the universal gas constant R, times the absolute temperature T. We immediately see that this law is indeed the combination of the three gas laws presented before. In the case of isothermal processes, where the gas temperature is constant, we obtain that the pressure P times the volume V is constant. Then we have obtained Boyle's law. For given temperatures T1, T2, T3 and so on, we have a family of isotherms in the volume versus pressure plot, which are hyperbolas. The range of validity of the ideal gas law with respect to real gases is represented by a color gradient. Over the area of a lower pressure range the transition from dark green to a brighter shade indicates that the ideal gas law gives more accurate approximation for dilute gases. In the case of isobaric processes the gas pressure P is constant. Then the volume V of the gas is proportional to its absolute temperature T, which is Charles's law. No reference volume determined at a given temperature appears in the law, since we measure the gas temperature in Kelvin. If the gas temperature is given in Celsius, then the volume expansion of the gas with respect to a reference volume measured at 0 Celsius is proportional to the temperature. Absolute temperature scale has the advantage that the actual volume of the ideal gas is directly proportional to the gas temperature measured in Kelvin. The isobars in the temperature versus volume plot consist of a family of lines starting from the origins of the axis, which represent absolute zero and a vanishing volume. The tangent of each isobar depends on the given values P1, P2 and so on of the gas pressure. 
at low temperatures the gas law is not valid, since the volume of an ideal gas shrinks to zero when we cool it down to absolute zero. The condensation of real gases shows that we cannot use the equation of state for an ideal gas at low temperatures. However, the law gives a good approximation at higher temperatures, indicated by the bright green area in the plot. In the case of isochoric processes, where the volume V of the gas is constant, its pressure P is proportional to its absolute temperature T. This is Gay-Lussac's law. Here we also see that the gas pressure is directly proportional to the temperature given in Kelvin, and we do not need to apply any reference pressure measured at a given temperature as in the case of the Celsius scale. The isochores in the temperature versus pressure plot consist of a family of lines starting from the origins of the plot, which represent absolute zero in a perfect vacuum. The tangent of each isochores depends on the given values V1, V2 and so on of the volume of the gas. According to this law, the pressure of the gas also vanishes at absolute zero, which is not the case in nature due to the condensation of gases. This law gives a good approximation at high temperatures and low pressure, indicated by the bright green area in the middle right side of the plot. As an overview on the combined ideal gas law or the equation of state for an ideal gas, we will give the representation of the law in the three-dimensional graph of pressure, volume and temperature. This representation also illustrates the relationship between the equation of state and the three gas laws formulated by Boyle, Charles, and Gay-Lussac. The ideal gas law for n-mole gas states that the product of the pressure P and the volume V of the gas is equal to n times the universal gas constant R, times the absolute temperature T of the gas. If the amount N of an ideal gas is given, that is N is equal to constant, then the equation of state is represented by a surface in the pressure volume temperature graph. That is, the state of the gas is uniquely represented by a point on the surface corresponding to the amount of the gas. If a given amount of gas obeys the ideal gas law and undergoes an arbitrary process, then both the initial and the final states of the gas are represented by some points on this surface. Boyle's law is related to such processes where the gas temperature is constant. We can plot the intersections of the surface with a family of planes for the constant temperatures T1, T2, T3 and so on. Since the temperature is constant, we are interested in the projection of these intersections onto the pressure versus volume plot. If we project the intersections onto the pressure volume diagram, then we obtain the isotherms of the given amount of gas, which are hyperbolas. Now we choose an arbitrary state A of the gas at a given temperature, let us say T3, which is a point on the surface. Then we can project this point onto the corresponding isotherm in the pressure versus volume plot. If the state A is the initial state of an isothermal process, then the volume V0 and the pressure P0 of the gas are the initial volume and pressure of the gas at the temperature T3. We choose another state B of the gas at the temperature T3 on the surface of the three-dimensional graph, which can also be projected onto the isotherm of the temperature T3. Let us denote the volume and the pressure of the gas simply by V and P in the state B. We see that the volume V of the gas in the final state is greater than its initial volume V0, therefore we talk about an isothermal expansion of the gas. Boyle's law states that the product of pressure P and the volume V of the gas measured in its final state is equal to the product of the initial pressure P0 and the initial volume V0 measured in the state A, if the gas undergoes this isothermal process. We can express the pressure P of the ideal gas as the product of P0 to V0, divided by its volume V. If we consider the initial state A as a reference state, then P0 and V0 are the reference pressure and volume of the gas measured at the temperature T3. We note that the temperature T3 can be chosen freely and does not need to be 273.15 Kelvin or 0 Celsius. Now we fix the product of P0 and V0, and the pressure P of the gas is just simply inversely proportional to its volume V, where the proportionality constant is P0 times V0. In the case of Charles's law we can follow the same procedure. Since the second gas law is related to isobaric processes, we can cut the surface with the planes of the constant pressures P1, P2, P3 and so on. We project these intersections onto the volume versus temperature plot, which are the isobars of the given amount of gas. These are lines with different tangents starting from the origin. Now we choose an arbitrary state C at a given pressure, let us say P1, which we project onto the corresponding isobar in the volume temperature diagram. Let us denote the volume and the temperature of gas in the state C by V0 and T0 respectively. We also choose another state D at the same pressure P1, and project it onto its isobar. The volume and temperature of the gas in the state D are simply denoted by V and T respectively. If the state C is the initial state and the state D is the final state of the gas, 
then the final volume V of the gas is greater than its initial volume V0, and we talk about an isobaric expansion of the ideal gas. Charles's law states that the ratio of the volume V to the temperature T of a gas in the final state is equal to the ratio of the initial volume V0 to the initial temperature T0 in isobaric processes. If the initial state C is a reference state and the ratio of V0 to T0 is constant, then the volume V of an ideal gas is directly proportional to its absolute temperature T, where the ratio of V0 to T0 is the proportionality constant. The third gas law can be analyzed in the same way. Since gay lussacs law is formulated for isochoric processes, we plot the intersections of the surface with the planes for the constant volumes V1, V2, V3 and so on in the three-dimensional plot. Then we project these intersections onto the pressure versus temperature plot, which gives the isochores of the given amount of gas. These are lines starting from the origin of the plot. We choose an arbitrary state E of the gas confined in a vessel with a given volume, let us say V3 on the surface in the three-dimensional graph, and project it onto the corresponding isochore. The pressure and the temperature of the gas in the state E are denoted by P0 and T0 respectively. We choose another state F on the intersection of the surface and the constant plane for V3, and project it onto the same isochore. The pressure P and the temperature T of the gas in the state F are greater than P0 and T0 measured in the state E. If the states E and F are considered as the initial and final states of the gas, we talk about an isochoric expansion of the gas. Gay-Lussac's law states the following. In the case of isochoric processes, the ratio of the pressure P to the temperature T of an ideal gas measured in the final state is equal to the ratio of the initial pressure P0 to the initial temperature T0 of the gas. If the initial state E is a reference state, then the pressure P of the gas is directly proportional to its absolute temperature T, where the proportionality constant is the ratio of the reference pressure P0 to the reference temperature T0. We have seen that the quantities pressure, volume and temperature completely determine the physical state of an ideal gas, and the equation of state establishes a unique relationship between them. As a result, if two of these quantities are given, they determine the value of the third one. We can express the pressure of a gas as a function of its temperature and volume. In the case of isothermal and isochoric processes, this function reduces to the functions of one variable presented in the discussions of Boyle's law and gay lussacs law. The volume of a gas can also be written as a function of its temperature and pressure. If we consider isothermal and isobaric processes, then this function gives the expression shown in the analysis of Boyle's law and Charles's law. Finally, we can express the temperature of a gas as a function of its pressure and volume. For isobaric and isochoric processes this function is simply the formulation of Charles's law and Gay-Lussac's law. We note that the relationship between the pressure, the volume and temperature of a gas is given by an equation of state, which is not necessarily the ideal gas law. The equation of state for real gases has many different forms, which were introduced to provide a better description of their behavior. These equations define different functional relations between the basic quantities of gases. As a result, their graphs are also represented by different surfaces for a given amount of gas in the pressure volume temperature graph. Nevertheless, we can still apply the procedure presented here, if we want to study the thermodynamic processes for real gases in special cases, such as isothermal, isobaric or isochoric processes. In the end of this presentation on ideal gas law, we will give a summary of the topics discussed here. We started with the introduction of the basic quantities or properties of gases describing the physical state of a gas. These quantities are the volume, the mass, the amount of substance, the density, the pressure and the temperature of a gas. We also gave a brief description of the methods and instruments applied to measure some of them. We presented mercury barometers, such as gay sachs barometer and Fodden's barometer, which were developed to measure air pressure. Another group of barometers, called aneroid barometers were shown here as well. We described two of them, VD barometer and a board and tube pressure gauge. We also presented several instruments measuring temperature, such as liquid in glass, bimetallic, gas in metal and thermoelectric thermometers. Then we presented Boyle's law which gives a unique functional relation between the pressure and the volume of a real gas at a constant temperature. The functional relation is very simple. The product of the pressure and the volume of a given amount of gas is constant for isothermal processes, that is if the temperature of the gas is constant. This gas law describes the behavior of real gases if the gas has a relatively low pressure. The next gas law we presented here was Charles's law, which states that there is a functional relation between the volume and the temperature of a real gas in isobaric processes, that is if the pressure of the gas is held constant. 
This functional relation is more complicated than the one in the case of Boyle's law if the temperature of the gas is measured in Celsius. Charles' law determines the relative change in the volume of a gas with respect to its volume measured at zero Celsius. The law states that this relative change is equal to the volumetric heat expansion coefficient times the temperature of the gas measured in Celsius at a given pressure. The volumetric heat expansion coefficient is a universal constant, and it is equal to 1 over 273.15 Celsius. This law only gives a good approximation for relatively warm gases, since gases condense into liquid at low temperatures. The third gas law shown here was Gay-Lussac's law, which states that the functional relation between the pressure and the temperature of a given amount of gas in isochoric processes, that is for a constant volume is the following. The change in the pressure of a gas with respect to its pressure measured at zero Celsius is equal to the pressure coefficient times the temperature of the gas measured in Celsius for a constant volume. The pressure coefficient is equal to the volumetric heat expansion coefficient, that is, it is also a universal constant. This law gives a good description of the behavior of real gases at relatively high temperatures and low pressure. Then we introduce the absolute temperature scale or Kelvin scale, which is the Celsius scale shifted by the reciprocal of the volumetric heat expansion or the pressure coefficient. The zero of the absolute temperature scale, known as absolute zero, is the coldest temperature in nature. By measuring the gas temperature in Kelvin, Charles's law could be cast in a simple form, stating that the volume of a given amount of gas is proportional to its absolute temperature for isobaric processes. If we use the absolute temperature scale, gay lussacs law also obtains a simple form, stating that the pressure of a given amount of ideal gas is proportional to its absolute temperature for isochoric processes. Finally, we applied these three gas laws to derive the combined ideal gas law or the equation of state for an ideal gas in the following form. The product of the pressure and the volume of an ideal gas is equal to the product of the amount of gas and the universal gas constant, times the absolute temperature of the gas. As a result, the three gas laws were interpreted as the special cases of the ideal gas law. Since we saw that the three gas laws only provide a good approximation for the behavior of real gases under given conditions, the validity of the combined gas law has also limitations. We defined an ideal gas as an idealized model of gaseous substances, for which the combined gas law or the equation of state is valid without any restriction. Therefore, real gases can be approximated with an ideal gas provided the criteria mentioned above for the three gas laws hold. That is, we regard a real gas as an ideal gas at relatively high temperatures and low pressure, and its equation of state is given by the ideal gas law.